Hi everyone, my name is Kivra Zengin and I'm the regional lead for Google Developer Groups and Women Tech Makers program on the North America Developer Ecosystem team at Google. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the Elevate with Google Developers. I would like to kick it off with an introduction to Elevate with Google Developers. Elevate is a full year applied skills program that we are going to host great speakers on a monthly basis on the themes of how to transition to a new career, how to grow your career, and how to grow yourself individually. Within those themes, we are going to touch on communication skills, leadership skills, negotiation, and so on. You can check out the website for more information on the schedule and the topics specifically. With every session, you can incorporate your learnings to your professional career and take it to the next level with some workshops and presentations that we will have throughout the year. We are thrilled that you could join us for all of the sessions moving forward, and we hope you all benefit from the content. Housekeeping for today. First of all, as this is a great guideline for all of our events, I would like to remind all of you that let's be excellent to each other. To that extent, please follow all the com community guidelines on our website and the links we share. Second of all, add your questions to the chat. Additionally, be mindful of your questions. And last but not least, we are here to help with your all questions. If you have any concerns or questions, you can share with us at loa-team at google.com. All right, let's get it started. Today's session will start with a presentation followed by a Q&A se session. You can ask your questions during the presentation on the comment section, and we are going to address all of the questions in a timely manner to get answers from the speakers. With that said, I would like to hand it over to our first speaker. Thank you so much for having me today, Google developers. I'm so excited to be a part of Elevate Training. My name is Elizabeth Morgan. I'm here today, I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can update your LinkedIn, your resume, and your network as you prepare for a career change, especially in these virtual pandemic times. Okay, so a little bit about me. I've been on LinkedIn since 2014. I started developing my LinkedIn profile. I showed off my skill sets, learned how to really utilize the platform. And now I'm on LinkedIn each week, sharing tips and insights that I've gained from the industry, talent acquisition, my own experiences. And I show off my insights to over 43,000 followers. In my spare time, I have fun uh, making earrings, kind of like these ones that I'm wearing right now. I'm on Etsy, I'm hanging out on Instagram, uh, crafting, I'm gardening, and I love making gluten-free treats. But the main focus and credibility for today, I review thousands of resumes here at Google. I spend a lot of work time reviewing technical program manager resumes and software engineer resumes many of them which come to me through situations where people are changing their careers and they're trying to show how experience they have from other companies or other positions are really making them qualified for this new role. So I'm gonna talk about that today. Here's a little bit about the agenda. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about career change struggles that a lot of people experience that they talk about. I'm gonna to explain to you how to update your LinkedIn so that you are credible and you can be seen for the right opportunities. Update your resume to utilize your previous skill sets so that you really show off that you are qualified for this new change that you're trying to make. I'm gonna give you some insight about how to tell your story on social media, uh, to recruiters, just as your own brand. And I'm gonna talk about how you can rally support as you make this change. So these are the things we're gonna work through today. Okay, so we'll start with the challenges. So challenge number one, it's hard to make 
a career change, to move into a new opportunity, especially when you don't have the skill sets. So for example, maybe you're an analyst, but you really wanna become a developer. You really wanna work on code. If you wanna start applying for those coding positions, you have to build up skill sets to do that. I'm gonna talk about some examples a little later on today about how you can do that, but it's really important that you build yourself up and you show how you're qualified for the positions that you're moving into. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is you don't know how to develop skill sets to make the change. I'm gonna talk about that a little later in this presentation as well, but changing careers takes time. There is a myth floating around that people just think that they can move into a new position without a lot of effort and preparation, but unfortunately that's not the case. It actually takes some strategy, it takes time, and you have to be patient with yourself as you're working to learn these new skills to show off how good you are at them. And then finally, the third challenge is figuring out how you can advocate for yourself on various platforms, whether it be on LinkedIn, whether it's on your resume, or whether it's you're starting to have interviews with staffing teams. There's a very good chance that you actually have more skills than you think you do. And it's important that you really learn how to bring those forward and advocate that you're great for the role. So I'm gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna to go through these challenges and explain how you can make them not challenges. <laughs> and we're gonna move through that now. So, I don't have the skills to move into this new position. I'm passionate about it. I really wanna move into a developer role, but I'm in human resources or I'm a recruiter. So the first thing that you need to do is find ways to develop these skills. I have a few examples that I've added on here. You can volunteer, especially I'm from the Bay Area. A lot of people in the Bay Area are starting their own companies. They're designing their own projects. There's a good chance that you have a friend or a coworker who's starting their own thing and they could use someone to help them build out the platform. If you're looking to change into a more technical role, you can volunteer and get involved that way. You can take classes, you can go back and get your degree. Uh, if you don't wanna commit that much time, you can get a certification. There are numerous platforms you can get certifications. You can reach out to a boss or a coworker and maybe someone who is currently doing a position that you're interested in getting involved in. You can reach out to them, let them know what you're going through and ask if they'd be willing to let you sit in on some projects or meetings that they're doing, or maybe just spend a couple hours a week, maybe take external time and just take that extra time to really dive into that skill set, that passion that you want to get more involved in and show yourself off that way. Um, part time work. When I was getting ready to move into the human resources field, I wasn't able to find any internships, so I actually started volunteering part-time at the local food bank within their HR department. I was helping sort through things, file, um, you know, help with kind of standard HR paperwork type things, but it gave me some hands-on experience that I wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't volunteered, if I hadn't taken on a part-time role. So. All of this comes together, you know, joining clubs, societies, organizations. There are a lot of meetups. Many of them are virtual right now. But if there's a passion that you're wanting to get more involved in, a skill set that you're wanting to develop further, these are just a few ideas out of many that you can just involve yourself in so that you can, one, meet people who are doing the things that you're interested in, get their insight, learn from them, two, find opportunities to build those skills up yourself. So that's how you knock down that challenge of, I don't have the skills to make a change. Here are some ways that you can meet people and you can gain those skills so that you no longer have to deal with that. Okay, next thing we're gonna talk about is how to advocate for yourself. So when you're changing careers, there's three main areas that you're going to need to advocate for yourself. On LinkedIn is the first one, 
your resume the second, and when you're networking is the third. I'm gonna go in depth within each of these, but I'll briefly touch base on them now. So advocating for yourself on LinkedIn, it starts by having a credible LinkedIn profile. I'll dive into a little more in depth how you can do that, but you can just Google getting to the LinkedIn all-star status, and that is a great first step. On your resume, you want to prove that you have the skills the company says that they need in the job description. You can prove that you have those skills through what I talked about on the last slide. All of the certifications, the groups that you're a part of, the projects you've been working on. You can talk about all of that on your resume so that it's not as much of a weird career jump that recruiters see when they're looking at your resume. For example, if someone hasn't done anything from the previous slide, if someone hasn't gotten creative, and they're currently a baker, and they're trying to code, uh, they want to get into some sort of entry-level software development role, they're going to be a lot more likely to move forward with the position. The recruiter is going to be a lot more interested in their profile if they show that Yes, they were baking cakes, but in their free time, they were actually coding an app that helped their small bakery business, uh, you know, behind the scenes with some of the more business aspects of the company. Or, you know, as I mentioned, getting creative in what you're doing day to day so that you can prove that you have those skills when you move into the next, uh, to the next thing. And then finally, when you're networking, as you're trying to rally support and you're trying to have people, um, you know, help you, throughout this process, you need to be able to explain in about a minute or less, in a few sentences, just what you're trying to move into, why you're trying to move into it, why you're passionate about it, and then specifically, what has led you to reach out to this specific person. People are going to want to support you in your journey, and I'm going to explain how to do that in a networking way. So let's hop into the very first one on LinkedIn. I'm going to briefly talk to you about how you can get to the LinkedIn all-star status. I have been at the LinkedIn all-star status for a few years now. It's gotten me so many cool opportunities. Um, I have not actually applied to any of the companies that I've worked at. All of them have found me through LinkedIn, through uh, a connection of a connection reached out to me and I've eventually made my way onto the team. Even here at Google, I actually had someone who sourced my profile. They reached out to me and said that they thought that I could be a great fit on the Google Talent Acquisitions team. I was extremely excited about this wonderful company and so I said yes and moved forward with it. I don't think I would be at Google today if I didn't have an all-star LinkedIn profile and these are all the things that you need in order to have that. So the first one, Make sure that you have a profile picture, and if you can, have a cover photo. For my profile picture, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, I'm Elizabeth Morgan. If you look, you see that I've got this bright green background. You see that it's just my head up to about right here. I've got a smile on my face. You wanna make sure if you have a profile picture that it's professional, that it's just you, that people can see your face and just have it bright, make it warm. You can saturate it a little bit. Have fun with your background. Uh, how I actually made my LinkedIn profile picture, I tacked up a bright green towel to my wall. I stood in front of it. Uh, I stacked some books up on a desk. I put my phone on a 10 second timer and pressed it, ran up to the wall, smiled, and let my phone do the rest of the work. Took the photo, ran back over to my phone, looked at it, and then I uploaded the photo into Lightroom, up to the saturation, up to the warmth, uh, fixed a pimple that I had on my cheek, and voila, I had my LinkedIn profile picture. Uh, I was not trying to attract a company that is uh, suit attire, so I was just wearing a simple t-shirt, but if you're looking to move into a company that has a strict dress code, you can make sure you have a collared shirt on. Um, just a little bit of information there. So the cover photo, you can design your own cover photo within Canva. That's a platform that I use to uh, utilize uh, that space for my LinkedIn cover photo. I added my Instagram handle and talked about some of the things I talk about on LinkedIn each week. But if you're looking to maybe move into like a developer role, you could 
add some funny bit of code or, you know, you can get creative with the cover photo, but make it part of your brand, make it part of what you want to be known for, uh, what you want to be remembered by. The second thing to getting to the LinkedIn all-star status, make sure you have your current position on your LinkedIn profile. So talk about what you're currently doing, uh, what your skill sets are, things like that within the current position. Make sure, I don't have this on here, but make sure that you also list your previous positions as well. Add in the projects that you're working on that are gonna make you qualified for this next role that you're trying to get into. Um, I've had a lot of people who have said, I don't really feel comfortable talking or showcasing some of my earlier experience in my career. I would argue that adding all of your experience will help you get found by more people who can resonate with what you've done or the things you're passionate about. And a very specific example I can share, I volunteered at a humane society for several years in college, rehabilitating dogs, introducing them to foster families, adopting them out, had a lot of fun with it. And my senior year, I actually had a company that is very famous uh, for their pet care. They reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to move forward with next steps for one of their processes. They found me on LinkedIn. They saw that I had volunteered at an animal shelter. They wanted to get to know me better. So things like that, you never know when previous passions, volunteer experience will actually align with a company that breathes that through their mission statement, their values, and they wanna move forward with you. So keep that in mind. Maybe that makes you wanna add things to your profile from your past. Maybe it makes you wanna keep some things off, but uh, be very strategic and intentional and add in specifically what you did in each of your previous experiences that makes you qualified for your skills, you should have at least five skills, but you can have up to 50 skills and you can highlight three of those skills. The skills is the most important part to really show your value. And that's because when recruiters are looking to source people's pr profiles for new positions, they're able to find people's qualifications for the role by searching their skill sets. So it's really, really important that the skills that you have, that you add onto your profile, that they all align with the position that you're trying to get into and the qualifications that you have now, because that's how recruiters are going to find you for opportunities. If people, if recruiters specifically are reaching out to you on LinkedIn right now, and they're not actually reaching out to you about positions that you're passionate about, Take a look at your skills and see if maybe the skill sets that you're highlighting on your profile are maybe not in line with the positions that you're trying to go for. If you're having a hard time trying to figure out what skills you wanna add, just a quick tip, you can go to a company called Onet and uh, they actually have, if you search your dream position, they're able to tell you what qualifications you should have, what responsibilities are required for the role. It's a wonderful resource. You can also look at job descriptions for uh, job titles that you're interested in. And you can take the skills from that that you have and add them to your LinkedIn profile. You wanna add your location, um, you know, depending on where you're at. If you are trying to move to the Bay Area, you can say, you know, moving to the Bay Area, but it's really important that you add in the location where you work. And then finally, one of arguably the most important component to getting to the all-star status is making sure that you have a heading and a summary that explain who you are, what you do, what your goals and interests are, and maybe even your hobbies. I've got that on my own LinkedIn profile. And if you wanna check me out after, uh, after this time that we spend together today, you'll see as well that I have a heading that talks about what I'm currently doing. Um, I add in what you can expect from me because I am more of an influencer within the LinkedIn community space. But for your heading, you can say that you're searching for opportunities within a specific area. You can talk about your current company or position, but you only have a few lines to catch someone's attention. I want to say, don't quote me on this, but I think it's about 15 words that you get total within your heading, 
within your summary, you get a few hundred characters that you can sort of get as creative as you'd like. But within your heading, especially, you want people to click on you. So you can say that you're open to opportunities in a specific field. Or, you know, as I mentioned, you can share where you're currently working at. Mine is people operations at Google. So these are all the things that help you get to the LinkedIn all-star status. Now I'm gonna share this, this crazy statistic. Um, you are 21 times more likely to get LinkedIn profile views when you have a professional headshot photo and a strategic cover photo. The statistics are extremely high as well for each of these things that I just briefly talked about. If you have your current position, 16 times more likely to be seen by recruiters. Uh, same with skills and location, heading and summary. You are more likely to be seen as credible. Recruiters are more likely to reach out to you. People are more likely to want to get to know you if you have a credible LinkedIn profile, making sure you have all those things I just talked about. As I mentioned, amount of LinkedIn profile views uh, 16 times more likely to be seen by people as opposed to someone who hasn't updated their title, their location, or their company descriptions. So you've got your LinkedIn at the amazing all-star status. You wanna know what to do next. So now I'm gonna talk about the three ways that I myself have personalized my LinkedIn and what you can do as well so that you are getting seen, people are interested in what you're doing, what you wanna do, and you're ultimately able to make that career change. So first thing is follow. Follow people who are in the roles that you wanna transition into. Follow people who have skill sets that you're interested in learning more about. Follow companies, hashtags, skill sets. If you're wanting to become a developer, look into all of the hashtags and all of the people, everything that you can just submerge yourself in so that LinkedIn becomes a, just a pool of resources for you, the aspiring developer. The second way to personalize your LinkedIn, connect and contribute. So something that I love to do, I do it several times a week and it's really helped me meet a lot of really cool people. I just go through my newsfeed and people who have just been really thoughtful with something they've posted, I love commenting on it, relating to them, saying that I agree with what they're saying, sharing a personal story, thanking them for being vulnerable, um, sharing my own experience. I will add a few sentences onto their posts and it's helped me have really meaningful conversations with people. It's helped me to meet other people who have then offered me opportunities and various job positions. Um, a quick little side note of something cool that happened. A few months ago, someone messaged me letting me know that I had liked a post that a fellow recruiter had made. Uh, the post was saying they were trying to find someone for a specific job. She saw the post and uh, reached out to the person who had made the post and she's now working on that team. And it was all because she saw something that I had liked because she was in my network, she was able to see it and now she's on the team. So you never know when a like or a comment could help someone else too. So um, contribute to the platform, connect with people and things that interest you. And then finally, this third way to personalize your LinkedIn things that I recommend you avoid doing. So a lot of people have headings that are extremely long. They don't utilize the very small amount of space that they have. And within their headings, I see a lot of people who write, seeking opportunities within the, and then it cuts off, dot, dot, dot. So all I see from their profile, based on when they're commenting and liking other people's you know, um, posts, I don't see anything about where they're from, what they're trying to do, what they're doing, as opposed to a heading similar to what I mentioned mine is earlier, people operations at Google. People know what I'm doing. Uh, they know what company I'm at. And then the second half of my heading is posting career content weekly. So, you know, people might hop into my profile noticing that I'm from Google and then they might decide they want to follow or connect with me because they see that I'm creating content on there each week. So make sure that you have a heading that's descriptive of who you are, where you're trying to go, and that it cuts off in a very strategic area so that it's not seeking opportunities in dot dot dot, which would mean people would have to click on your profile to learn more about you. 
if they're not interested in your first few words in your heading, they're not going to click on your profile. So make sure that those first few words are very strategic. And then finally, or a second uh, thing to avoid is dumping past experience onto LinkedIn without sharing how it impacted. So recruiters have a general knowledge of what jobs are, what skill sets you need to have, what things you do within the jobs, but they don't know what made you special while doing the job. How did you contribute? What were you known for? During this nine to five or this volunteer project, what made you unique and how did you go above and beyond? Add that into your LinkedIn. You can check out my previous LinkedIn experience and you'll see that I'm giving specific percentages of ways I impacted things. I'm talking about what I brought of myself to this new role or idea that really ramped it up in ways that maybe someone else didn't. And then finally, spam messaging hiring teams asking strangers for referrals. So you really want to avoid reaching out to people and asking them to do things for you. Um, people are less likely to take an interest in you. They're less likely to want to help you. It, as frustrating as it is when you're um, blunt in that way and you ask someone to do something for you and they don't know you, it's harder for them to advocate for you. So get to know people, support them, and you will find yourself starting to build meaningful relationships with people. And from there, you're able to start helping them how you can and receiving help in return. So I talked about LinkedIn, how to develop your profile and how to personalize your profile so that you can really start to advocate for yourself in your career change. Now I'm going to talk about how to build a quality resume. I've reviewed over 40,000 resumes in the past three years and I am here to tell you things that you should do to your resume so that your point gets across that you're qualified for the role, your resume gets to the hiring manager, and you're able to move forward. So I've shared a few things here that I recommend. First of all, try and keep your resume to two pages tops. I have heard recruiters at various companies say that people who have three, four, ten page resumes it's actually a red flag for recruiters because some recruiters have said that they see that it means that you can't eloquently sum up your experience, that maybe you don't communicate very well, that potentially you are someone who thinks that they've done more than they've actually done, and it's a red flag. So try and keep your resume to one to two pages, two pages if you have a senior leadership quality background experience, 10 plus years of experience, and make sure each experience that you have, try and just have three powerful bullet points. When I say powerful bullet points, I'll move into the, the little blue dot here. For each bullet point of experience, showcase how this experience makes you qualified for the next experience you're trying to move into. So powerful bullet point, prove that you are quality for the role, that you're someone that my company should invest in. What why did you apply? What makes you qualified? The third uh, recommendation I have for your resume, take two or three lines at the top of your resume. If you can, you don't have to, but it, it's always impactful when you just quickly share a couple sentences, why you're applying for the position, what makes you qualified, and maybe why this specific company. You can just share in two or three sentences total, but that's a way that you can really cater your resume towards the company or the position you're applying to, to make the recruiter's eyes kind of light up and go, oh wow, they didn't just spam send this in, they actually really seem qualified for this opportunity that I have. Um, this red little circle right here kind of aligns with the green one above. In this red point, I say, show your impact, not just what you did. Kind of like I shared on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn and your resume are going to go hand in hand. You can knock this out in just a single weekend, spend a few hours eating some yummy snacks, listening to some good music and just cranking it out. But in these bullet points that you have, it's really important that you don't just say, yeah, I baked cakes, uh, chocolate, vanilla and strawberry. That's all I share. Instead, like I said, if you were coding and helping out extra, what were you doing aside from just helping your aunt and uncle with their bakery? How were you, you know, behind the scenes giving an impact to what was going on? 
So show the impact, don't just show what you did. And then finally, this is a point that's often overlooked. Make sure that your resume is easy to read, that it's in a simple format, um, you don't have any spelling errors, and that you don't have any fabrications. Make sure that your LinkedIn and your resume show that you were working at a company for the same amount of time, you had the same position. Um, any sort of errors between your LinkedIn and your resume could warrant a recruiting team passing you up for fear that maybe you're fabricating on one of the platforms. So just make sure that you're truthful about what you've done, where you've done it, um, what you contributed, and make sure that you don't have any grammar errors or spelling errors. Okay, the final thing I'll talk about today, and thank you so much for bearing with me through this point. I'm actually going to be answering some of your questions live momentarily, so thank you so much for, for sticking around at this point. Okay, so moving into networking. I have three main components to networking so that you can successfully advocate yourself, advocate for yourself in your career change. So the first thing is the elevator pitch. I talked about this earlier. It's so, so important to have one to two minutes prepared. I have done this myself. I've actually looked at myself in my mirror and rehearsed it, but you want to be able to share what you're currently doing, what you want to do, how you're developing yourself to do it, and what's been inspiring you along the way. People want to know your story. They want to know your motivations and your goals. If you can share them briefly and you can share them impactfully, people are going to want to help you. Really rehearse that. The next aspect of networking, make sure that you're talking to the right people. So I don't know if there's necessarily wrong people, but there are people who are more likely to help you be successful in your career change. Hiring managers, recruiters, people who currently do the job that you're interested in, uh, your current coworkers, and even friends. These are all people that you can reach out to. You can tell your elevator pitch above to, just in the middle of conversations. Maybe you're catching up, they ask you what's new with you. You can share your elevator pitch with your family, even as sort of a, even as sort of a practice round. Maybe your family knows someone, a, a relative, a distant relative, or even a friend of your mom who is currently coding something really cool. And maybe they're able to help you. They're able to get you on board, spending your free time volunteering, contributing towards a project. That's something you can add to your resume. You practice your elevator pitch. You're getting to know people who are doing what you want to do. So talking to the right people. And then finally, there are quite a few ways that you can network even during these pandemic times. LinkedIn is my favorite way to network. You can you have so many people at your disposal that you can just reach out to very easily. You can share your elevator pitch with them, let them know why you're connecting with them specifically, what they're doing that fascinates you, that's caused you to reach out to them. You can network on Facebook. Facebook, in my opinion, is really changing in a cool way. Yes, you have your family on there. You're less invested in what people from your high school are doing. But what's cool about Facebook is you're now able to join groups of people who have shared a similar passion. For example, I mentioned earlier that I make my own earrings. I recently started my own earring business. In my spare time, I've actually joined um, polymer clay earring groups on Facebook where people give each other tips. They sell their supplies. They really try and help each other out. Uh, and give recommendations on how they can further improve their earrings. I haven't looked because I'm not working on becoming a developer or, you know, changing my career in, you know, a, a substantial way, but look, in, look into different groups on Facebook and see if you can join any of those and maybe meet up with people virtually, uh, socially distance, and just get to know them a little more and what their background is. And then finally, coffee chats. Um, you know, as we move into hopefully um, a, a healthier year, 2022, maybe later stages of 2021, I'm not sure, you know, what uh, networking and coffee chats are going to look like in the coming months, but 
it's very easy to reach out to someone just like how I'm communicating with you right now virtually and just get to know them. Ask for 10 to 15 minutes of their time to get to know them further. So here's some ways that you can network into your career change. Now to just wrap all of this together, it's, it is not easy to change careers. It is not easy to find a job. It takes a lot of time and your efforts What's really challenging about this process is you put a lot of time into this at the beginning and you start really sharing yourself out with the world and not everyone resonates and not everyone helps and it's very discouraging. But you're going to come across these gold star people who are there for you who want to help. Groups that want to get involved and, and impact similar to this group that you're following today. Your first job application, your first networking conversation, it's not gonna be your last, it's gonna take time. But the more effort you put into this, the more quality things are gonna happen. So keep that in mind. Um, another point, you are more than your rejection. Companies can't personally look at you, know who you are, know what you've done, know how you can impact, and then reject you. They don't have the time, they don't have the resources. So what I'm trying to say is it's it's important that you don't take your rejection personally, especially at the start. As you're trying to transition in your career to this new opportunity, a lot of companies aren't going to know your passions and your drives and your interests. They want someone with a very specific skill set, very specific background, and if you don't meet that, that's okay. There's going to be a company that's looking for someone like you that's fascinated by the background that you have and how it gives you unique skills that really make you qualify for what's next. So just know that that's coming. Keep advocating for yourself. Look for new and creative ways to advocate for yourself. And then finally, just stay creative. Keep advocating, brand yourself. You're gonna be great. Thank you so much for joining us today. It really means a lot that you took time to be here and now I'm gonna be answering your questions in our live Q&A. Great. So here we go, uh, welcome back. And then we are going to take your questions one by one. And then right now, Elizabeth will just uh, try to answer them all uh, in one, at once. And let's start with the first question. So let's see. Um, okay, I will just read it out loud uh, so you everyone can just see. When taking classes, certifications, how much does it benefit you to go to the specific accredited type or big name places for those? Do recruiters, companies hold bias for certain ones? Great question. It really depends on the company. Something that I really recommend that you do is look at the company's website and see what things they are involved in right now. Maybe they are partnering with different coding groups. Uh, maybe they have their own coding groups that you can look to get involved with. Those coding groups might have social media platforms, whether it's on Instagram, YouTube, or even Facebook that you can look into. So I'd say really depends on the company, but do your research on the company and you should be good. Just having any sort of class or certification experience that aligns with what you're trying to transition into is only gonna help you. I also realized I just jumped right in and I just wanted to quickly take a second to say thank you everyone for being here. I was having fun chatting with you and I know we don't have a lot of time together, only about 20 more minutes, but you can message me on LinkedIn after this and I would be more than happy to continue a conversation if there's anything I wasn't able to answer in our time together. So, all right, moving yeah. right along. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, this is great. So yeah, thank you so much, Elliot, uh, for asking this question. And then we can just move on to the next question then. So Tricia um, is asking, I was wondering if certificates of completion, like those offered on LinkedIn Learning, are worth uh, including on your on a resume? So yeah, this is a great question. Elizabeth? Yeah, I love this question. It is great. Um, I think it depends on how the certification aligns with the job that you're trying to get into. So for example, if you took some sort of certification on C++, but the job description for the company that you're applying to isn't asking 
for any sort of specific coding language background, you might not want to include it. You might not have the space to include it. But if you are looking into, you know, applying to a role that is looking for you to have a specific type of background, maybe you don't have it, you can include these certifications. I I haven't seen a lot of LinkedIn certifications listed on people's resumes, but if that's really the only experience that you have up to this point, and you're trying to transition into a role that really seems interesting to you, give as much information as you can that proves sort of your story as to why you're trying to change processes, if that, like why you're trying to change jobs. Hopefully that answers your question. I'm getting a lot of questions on the side too. Really great questions. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you. And then the next question coming from Jay, how much effort does personal portfolio website bring? Yeah, great question. Um, for larger companies, it really does depend on the role. If the position that you're applying to is looking for someone who's going to be designing websites, um, any sort of client work, you should absolutely include your website. And I would recommend um, including it anyways, on the off chance that the team wants to look at, look into your background a little bit deeper. But um, yeah, I, I'd say include it. There is no harm to not including it, but including it does give you a chance to, to you know get to know people um, who might wanna, um, how would you say it? People who want to invest in you. One thing that I would say to be really careful about with your portfolio is make sure that you have really quality information on there, that it's very aesthetically pleasing. Uh, you don't want people to say no to you because they don't think you have a good portfolio. So just keep that in mind and be very critical of what you do decide to share with the staffing team. Amazing. So thank you. And then the next question is, for a technical role, how much detail would an HR expect when it comes to how many and what kind of platforms have I worked on? Great question. So the HR person who's reviewing your resume, they have a lot of technical lingo experience. They know what types of coding backgrounds and platforms you should be using, synonyms for you know what you've been working on, and they're gonna share your profile with the team. I recommend getting technical on your resume because they should have that knowledge, but more importantly, they're gonna be sharing your resume with a hiring manager, and that person has done your job and knows the background. So don't worry too much about um, getting overly technical in your resume, but when you are getting technical, make sure that you're sharing the impact. When you coded this project, what happened? What happened when you did this to the app? What was the final goal that everyone was looking into that you were able to achieve because you, you know, you helped with this project or whatever it was? Those are the types of things that HR is looking for when they're screening your technical resume. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Let's just get another question. So we have lots of questions. Great questions. Um, is it recommended to include a good amount of products? slash platforms from a certain vendor or keep it generic? I'm trying to understand um, what you're getting at with this question. Is it recommended to include a good amount of products or platforms? Um, get as specific as you'd like, but make sure that it aligns with the job description. If the company is looking for very specific experience and you have that from a previous vendor or from several, totally added in there. Your resume is all about painting a picture as to why you are qualified for the role that you're applying to and why they should choose you. Perfect. And then we will move on with the next question. A bunch of questions, Elizabeth, just keep tight. <laughs> we have 15 <laughs> minutes left, yes. Um, yeah, these are great, like perfect. Noel is just asking us, um, is it okay to reach out to directly hiring manager, letting them know that you have applied for the position and would love to schedule a conversation? Yeah, I know that there were a few questions kind of centered around this. So I'm thinking maybe I can respond to this question and maybe knock out a few other answers as well so that we can uh, keep moving forward. It's definitely challenging to try and get in touch with the hiring team on LinkedIn because they get a lot of outreach from people. and 
they're already trying to have phone conversations with people who are qualified for the role. So what I recommend that you do is, yes, send them a message, letting them know why you applied to the role, why you specifically are interested in their company and say, I wanted to let you know I applied. I'm very excited. Um, you know, I hope that you take an interest in my profile. You don't have to follow up asking for a phone call because the truth of the matter is if they're interested in you, they're going to try and set up a phone call. If they're not, they're just going to leave crickets and it's going to be uncomfortable. So somebody else asked if it was better to reach out to a recruiter instead. I would send that message to the recruiter the hiring manager, and potentially if you know the types of people who are on the team because maybe they have the role of the position that you are applying to, I reach out to them as well. Just a very standard message. Hey, I apply to this position, first line, second line. Here's the reason why I apply to this position, i.e. like what makes me qualified. And then third line is why you apply to this specific company, why you're passionate about it. And then just end with, you know, thank you so much. Hopefully that knocked out a few questions that we had in the chat. <laughs> yes, perfect. And then Liam is asking, how would you recommend showcasing your ability when your job title doesn't reflect your work slash seniority? So would impactful points be enough? Great question. Absolutely. People are reading your resume. And I actually saw a comment on the side, somebody asking about our applicant tracking systems. And what I'll say is, at almost all companies, it's a human being that's reviewing your resume that determines whether or not they're gonna move forward with your application. So your mind can feel a little bit at ease. There's not generally a robot saying yes or no to things and categorizing you based on your resume. But what I'll say is one quick tip, we're gonna link my LinkedIn profile. And you can see from my current role at Google and my most previous role that I have shared very impactful statements showcasing how I did way more than what my core role asked me to do. Um, and so to, to answer your question a little more specifically, there's a good chance your job title is not going to reflect the hard work you put into your role, the skills that you've gained. That's common. It shows that you're ready to grow and move into something new. And that's what recruiters and hiring teams are looking for. So what I recommend that you do instead is really hammering down on those impactful points on your resume. What did you do? How did you impact? How did it enhance things for the future? And why does it align with this role that you're applying to? You have to be very strategic with every statement. And if you'd like, as I mentioned, you can hop over to my LinkedIn and see how I worded some stuff on my LinkedIn profile because that's exactly how my resume bullet points look as well. I hope that helps. Cool. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And then. Whew. <laughs> these are really great questions as i said like, they are it's just wonderful yeah and then i'm hopefully you know all like all of this uh content and then you know all of the answers are really really right now useful for all of you so stacy yes so one of my actually like friends here so she's just asking what is your thoughts on the one page resume plus linkedin and links versus the multi-page resume Great question. Everyone has a different opinion about your resume, what fonts you should use, what size, what colors, but the one thing that's important is the content on your resume. So what I'll say is your resume should only be one to two pages and you should include the relevant information to the role. So if you're not including the specific details, but you're instead including a link to a website and you're not you are not strategically trying to prove why you're qualified for the role on that little page that you have. You're not going to do yourself justice. The team is not going to click into your background. They have hundreds, if not thousands of other people that they're looking at. All you have is your resume to prove yourself. So what I recommend is add in a short blurb that would make them want to click the link. For example, here's how I impacted this specific project. Uh, you can see the results here and then you include the link. So I'd say you kind of want to smush the two together, Stacy, so that you have the links, so you're not having to make it two, three, oh man, I once screened a 27 paid resume, too long, right? Um, but make sure that you have specific reasons why the team should click into the link. Great, and then I guess next step, um, Naomi is asking, what was your experience landing your job at Google? What would 
you have you done differently when applying slash interviewing yeah this is actually like a common question i guess coming from all of the people around the world so yes elizabeth <laughs> yeah um i actually did not apply to google they had a sourcer who reached out to me on linkedin so they were interested in my background and they wanted to start a conversation and I, of course, said yes. <laughs> so um, I worked harder for my Google interview than I ever have in any other interview. And I recommend, I, I wouldn't do anything differently, quite honestly. I really worked my butt off and put a lot of effort into it. I researched all of the information about the team I'd be joining. I read books on the HR leaders who had uh, founded the HR departments at the company. I did a ton of research. I made note of all the processes that they used to make the company what it was. I related that back to my own experience and I literally took the job description and I looked at each bullet point, each requirement that Google was looking for. And in my mind, I rehearsed two, three, four stories of my experience and how it related to the role I was applying to and why it made me qualified and I just, I remember having a glass of wine sitting in my bathtub and a cupcake and just rehearsing, talking out loud. I probably sounded crazy, uh, but just laying in my bathtub, drinking wine, rehearsing it uh, two, three, even four days, below, uh, four days before and put a lot of time into it and really worked on advocating for myself. So I recommend just doing the same for you. Um, at any company that you're applying to where you're really passionate about the role and where you really think you align with the position Be able to eloquently speak as to why and you're gonna get people's interest Yeah, actually this seems uh, the same to me like I, I felt the same thing, you know while I was just interviewing with Google so uh, This resonates me very well Elizabeth. I guess people are going through the same uh things all together so okay perfect and then the next question what can be done about job gaps i have a very limited amount of actual job experience since i've been a stay at home mom for 10 plus years great question there's a lot you can do to get creative i'm assuming you haven't just been sitting on your couch for 10 years there's a lot that you've been doing you've been volunteering uh, on side projects. It might not exactly align with the position you're trying to get back into again, but I recommend taking time to just make a list. What were the key things you've done over the past 10 years each year? What was something that you were involved in that you helped out with? A bake stand, a fundraiser, something you ran? And you can find a way to share the impact of those things, even if it's raising five phenomenal human beings and not pulling my hair out. I've seen things like that on resumes before. The concern with the gap is not that you left, it's that you didn't develop your experience during the time you were away. Because unfortunately, technologies change, positions change. We need people who are fresh in the sense that they have recent experience working within these things. So um, if you can, I would recommend trying to get certifications. Everything I mentioned a little earlier in the presentation, start getting involved in projects. Ask some friends that you know if you can help out with things. Uh, can you volunteer part time at a friend's company, you know, et cetera? How can you get creative? And in addition to the experience that you're maybe not giving yourself credit for right now, um, in addition to that experience after you've thought through it, making sure that you know you're opening yourself up to opportunities and then finally you might not end up in the exact same position you were in 10 years ago you have to be a little bit creative and flexible when you're first getting your feet back into corporate world again um, but after a couple of years you should find yourself in a very similar place as to where you were when you left so it just takes a bit of time and patience and I'd be happy to connect uh, further and talk about this because it's definitely challenging. It takes a lot of strategy to market yourself as a stay-at-home parent. But um, in today's society, especially in these pandemic times, it's a lot more common to see career gaps. You shouldn't be insecure about it. You should just be able to prove why you weren't just sitting on your couch for the past 10 years. Hopefully that offers some insight. Yeah, amazing questions for the audience. Um, and then the other one is people have been suggesting to include numerical measures of the impact you had in your role. 
can you give some tips on it for me as a developer? Great question. Um, it really depends on, again, the position that you're applying to and what specific impact they're looking for. So look at the job description. Are they looking for someone who has published an app onto GitHub? Uh, I saw a question on the side earlier. Yes, recruiters look at your GitHub, but more especially hiring managers look at your GitHub. So update that. Um, so numerical measures of impact could be, let's see, bugs that you fixed. Um, you know, what efforts did you contribute towards the final thing that happened to the app? Did the app, uh, did investors, you know, buy the app from you? You know, what what sort of happened what was the story of the app and how did you contribute towards making it successful? There are a lot of things that you can add, um, but I would just look at the job description and see what the company is looking for, cater it to that. And there's actually a lot, you can just Google online technical resumes or software development resume, and you'll be able to see sort of the, um, the key performance metrics that people have shared. And hopefully that helps you. Thanks for the question. Perfect. And then uh, we are going to take a few more questions because we are going to start our next session with another speaker. So hopefully we will make that happen. And then next question that we can see right now, we have three minutes left. And thank you so much, Elizabeth, for you know making the time with us. This is amazing. Um, Alice, so she's asking in starting uh, a LinkedIn presence now, should we start with early projects and show a linear progression? or start with current slash most impressive, then slowly share past and dump at all at once? I say dump it all. What I did, I took a Saturday, made some brownies, sat down, had some coffee, ate some brownies, and just copy pasted everything from my resume into LinkedIn. I added all my relevant skill sets that aligned with the types of positions I was applying to. Just got it done. It's less stressful that way. Perfect. Great tips. And then Sahil is asking, how do I decide between trying a real hard for a job in the top tech companies versus a job where I would do really well, be satisfied and grow as a professional? That is an interesting question because I would argue that the second area of that statement can be done uh, in a top tech company. It just depends on your perspective, your motivation, and also your interest in the role. So I'd say to really decide what you want to do, apply to the positions that you're passionate about, really interview the team to see if the things that they're doing, the ways they're communicating, the projects that they're working on, if it aligns with who you are, what you do, the types of people you want to be around because you're with them 40 hours a week, and make decisions based on that. There's a lot of amazing teams and wonderful people no matter where you land up. It's just a matter of your priorities. Definitely. And then one last question we can take, I guess. And then. Good one. Final question. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Drum beat. <laughs> Ooh, they're really thinking for us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we had great questions like on the side. I'm sure we maybe uh, when you have time or something, you said that you are uh, happy to just take other questions on LinkedIn or like maybe we can just share some contact information too so yeah um, yeah absolutely cool. um perfect thank you and then last question yes do hr or recruiter look at the portfolio if you are applying for a backend position yeah they absolutely do everything that you share is going to be reviewed if you make it far enough along in the interview process so i'll close with that uh thank you so much for having me Feel free to connect on LinkedIn. I made a post about this earlier. I think um, for those of you who had questions that were a little less personal, I actually recommend commenting on my LinkedIn post so that we can get a conversation going and help as many people as possible. I only say that because my LinkedIn inbox is pretty inundated. I get about 100 messages a week, and it's pretty hard for me to respond individually. So trying to sort of help as many people as I can. But feel free to message me on LinkedIn if you have sort of a more personal situation you'd like to talk through that you don't want eyes on. So uh, I really enjoyed being here today, and, and I'm so... I'm so hopeful that all of you find your dream situation here very soon, especially in these times. So stay safe and healthy. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining. And then, yeah, let's just go to our next speaker then. So I would like to introduce our next speaker, so who is uh, Jason Scott uh, from the North America Developer Ecosystem team. And he will be talking about the networking piece uh, topic, actually, which is a quite you know um, interesting topic. Let's just welcome him. Thank you for having me. Um, so for everyone, my name is Jason Scott. I'm head of startup developer ecosystems here in the US for Google. Um, and today we're gonna chat about networking. Um, and the subtitle is from an undercover introvert, which I'll tell you more about. But for those of you who are introverts in the room, really want to say that networking doesn't have to be intimidating and networking can be fun. And also it doesn't have to be exhausting. So let's dive right in. So me, uh, this is me. Um, I like to think of myself as an undercover introvert. Uh, uh, you can ask some of my friends and family, they might disagree with you, but for me, um, although networking is something and people are something that I love and enjoy, um, I, they do require a lot of energy. And for me, I've had to really think about ways to scale um, and make networking fun and easy and simple. Um, and those are the tips that I'm here to share with you today around how I've made networking work for me as an undercover introvert. Um, so for me, uh, networking has really been a secret power in my career or a secret weapon in my career. Um, when I think about my career, um, it's a lot of um, serendipitous things that have happened. Um, I started my career at MIT, I'm an undergrad and kind of went into consulting afterwards and uh, made the jump over the Bay Area into startups um, right before getting my MBA at Stanford um, and then uh, dove into venture capital right after that and, and eventually ended up here at Google working on our startup ecosystem work. Um, but the common thread um, that I would love to um, kind of reflect on with respect to that is in my journey is that every job that I've taken has actually been because there was someone that I knew that introduced me either to that organization or to someone at the organization and was able to vouch for me. Um, and it really makes me think about the power of the network um, and that um, I candidly am not someone who uh, does well in the interview process. So I've really been able to rely on people to, to help me um, and open those doors um, and rely on my network to do so. Um, and, and when I reflect back on kind of why networking has, has, has kind of been at the forefront of my life, um, there are a few moments um, throughout my kind of upbringing that really stand out. Um, the first, and don't laugh, but the first is um, one of my favorite movies. Um, my, one of my favorite movies is Pay It Forward, a movie that came out in 2000. Um, and that movie is all about uh, doing things for other people um, without the expectation of something coming back your way um, for the sake of um, just helping others. I mean, I'll get to how that applies to networking soon um, and, why, and my philosophy around networking, but uh, remember that is one of the topics. Um, secondly, was a book that I received when I was 18 called Never Eat Alone. Um, and that book is all about um, networking and, and again, how to make other people successful um, as part of your networking strategy and kind of your philosophy around networking. And then lastly, um, I remember uh, doing superlatives often as many of us do um, both at work and, and, and when we were in grade school. And one of the superlatives that I won uh, back um, when I was in high school was around best supporting actor. And for me, that has really stayed with me as something that really, um, I know we joke um, and, uh, around kind of, if you were to win an award, an Academy Award, a Golden Globe, what would that award be? For me, truly the best supporting actor role is something that, um, um, I've always respected as someone who's really able to lean in and help someone else be successful. So we'll get into the theme of, of, of networking, but the philosophy for me has always been around how do I help other people be successful in my network and put a lot of value into my network so that my network can then, um, um, everyone can then be elevated to be more successful in their journey. So networking first comes in many flavors. Um, not just the ones on the top of the slide, uh, but many, many flavors, um, inbound, outbound, organic. I um, mean, we'll talk about um, how to apply some of these tips and tricks, um, regardless of the, the context with which networking is starting for you, um, how to apply and make networking easy and fun. Uh, secondly, it doesn't have to feel like work. I tell this to everyone. I know a lot of people are, are, are find networking daunting, find it exhausting. Um, but networking should be fun um, and you can find ways to adjust your strategy around networking to make it fun and 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 integrate it into things that you enjoy doing 
Um, and then lastly, it's not just for in- extroverts. Um, a lot of people say like uh, to me oftentimes, hey, well, it's, um, I'm not an extrovert. I, I really consider myself an introvert. Um, so networking and going to networking events and things like that really do feel like a burden to me. Um, and what I'm here to say to you today is networking is not just for extroverts. Networking is for everyone. And there are ways to make networking feel organic to you and, and match the things that, that do give you energy. Um, so goal for today is to make networking feel less daunting, less intimidating, and to help you get more value out of networking, um, especially in this now digital first world that we've been in over the last 12 months. So I like to call this presentation eight and a half <laughs> just for ne- effective networking. Um, I will get to the half at the end, but I will walk you through eight different strategies and, and just tips to really make networking uh, work for you and the things to reflect on. Of course, we're not going to solve every um, challenge and we won't go into a lot of detail in this short presentation, but they leave you with a few things to reflect on with respect to how you approach networking and hopefully again, make it easier for you. Um, so as you know, three different kind of ways in which networking happens. So there's proactive networking. Everyone has done outbound emails, cold emails, recruiting, uh, whether you're recruiting or um, maybe you work in sales or maybe you're looking to just learn more about a specific topic. Um, well, I'm sure all of us are guilty of sending that cold email to someone that we don't know, to a stranger or someone that we know very loosely um, as a way to connect with them. So um, a proactive networking, of course, is something that I think is a valuable skill um, to know how to do well um, as a way to kind of create those connections. Um, of course, there's organic networking that happens. Um, and this is something that we're all familiar with, um, whether it be at an in-person event or um, <laughs> Maybe you're a member of Clubhouse and, and are meeting people there digitally, um, but as a way to really um, and, and meet people organically and serendipitously. Um, uh, and we'll get to how some of these tips and tricks apply, even if it's something that was unexpected and the connection is unexpected and in the moment. Um, lastly, there's reactive networking. Uh, I think as we all kind of progress through our careers um, and, and as you kind of become an expert in whatever field or a function that you work in, um, you'll have more and more reactive networking in which people are reaching out to you um, to connect with you about various topics or requests to meet. And I know for many, that is the one, one of the ones that feels the most daunting because it is, um, it is inbound, um, it's out of your control and it usually comes when, um, just when you're busiest. Um, so we'll talk about also for those of you who are thinking about how do I manage reactive networking, ways to make that again um, a little bit more, um, a little bit less daunting, a little bit more manageable for you um, in your roles. And hopefully these tips aim to be helpful regardless of your situation. So first tip, I think um, before you're going into any sort of networking situation, I generally tell everyone, you have to think about um, how can you be transparent um, and start with clearly managed expectations. Um, I like to always remind people, humans can't read minds, so don't force them to. Um, and oftentimes I think people, when they approach a networking situation are often scared to get to the punch or get the, be upfront about why they're looking to connect. And, and really, um, but what I found is that for people on the receiving end, uh, oftentimes, especially myself included, I like it, I like it when you just open with why you're excited to connect. Um, why always start with the why and what opportunity do you, have you already identified for us to collaborate or to partner or for me to help you so that I can understand your goals and what are the goals of the meeting ahead of us actually connecting. Um, honestly. Um, it allows you to focus the time, focus the, com- the conversation. The last situation you want is in the last five minutes of a conversation to, to then get to the meat of why you're excited to connect with that person. So if you can start up with that, it's not just for you. Again, it's, it's out of respect for the other person and, and out of respect for their time and to really make, so, make it so that networking is efficient and the conversation is efficient. And honestly, so that you're talking about um, something that you're, you're both eager to, to dive in and can, and can find ways to get there directly versus having to um, figure out how to navigate to the meat of the conversation during the conversation. So first and foremost, be transparent and don't be, a, don't be um, afraid to be upfront with why you're excited to connect with an individual. Next, um, the second tip I would say is do the quick research. I'm not saying dive in and learn everything about someone, uh, but literally just taking five minutes, um, take uh, in, in the slide I said two and a half, two and a half, but take 
two and a half minutes to dive into LinkedIn, scroll, understand that person's past, their professional past, how 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 have they gotten to where they are today. Um, but secondarily, just do a quick two and a half minute Google search, type their name into Google and understand like, have they published any articles that are interesting that you find interesting? Have they been in any press that you might find interesting? And you'd be surprised what you might find as a common interest or, or common activity or common past um, as a way to really kind of connect and anchor um, and uh, anchored the conversation from the start, right? Um, I always say the goal of your Venn diagram of your interests with another person's interests, right? And that allows you to really connect with that person and again, uh, anchor the rest of your conversations and make it feel organic and natural versus um, trying to search for that during a conversation itself. Third, I say make it productive. Um, and this is especially true for my introverts in the room. Um, you have to find ways to expand your fuel tank. If you think of um, your capacity to being social as a fuel a, a fuel tank, find ways to expand it. Find ways to make it not feel like work, as we mentioned earlier. So how do you integrate networking into your daily activities versus finding ways to squeeze it in? Um, for me, again, a good example is I, I, I enjoy fitness. Um, it's something that I it do every day anyway. So, and I found it's always fun to, to invite someone to join me for a class. And then afterwards, maybe we um, get a quick fright or get a quick coffee and then chat. Um, one, you're already connecting on a common interest. Um, two, it's a cool way to invite someone into your life and learn something a little bit more about you and make it feel less transactional. And then finally, it, it makes it part of your standard routine, right? So um, from, for all of you who are as efficient with your time or hope to be, aspire to be more efficient with your time, Finding ways to integrate networking into your natural day and your natural routine makes it feel a lot less daunting than thinking about how, when do I squeeze in this extra activity, this extra coffee, this extra meal that it, that I don't necessarily want to have um, just for the sake of connecting with that person. Um, again, so finding ways to fuel, expand your fuel tank, um, especially if you consider yourself an introvert and make it easier for yourself and have some self-compassion by, again, integrating it into your daily life. Fourth, and I talked about one of my favorite books is called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi, but um, I actually think the title speaks for itself. Um, that's not what all, the only thing that the book is about, but the title speaks for itself with respect to one of my tips. Um, um, not necessarily saying never eat alone. <laughs> of course, I personally enjoy my my own uh, meals by myself all, often, but I would say take advantage of meal time, and it kind of goes to my last point a little bit as well. Um, have a set time in your calendar. Maybe it's a set recurring coffee. Um, that happens on a certain frequency or a certain cadence. Maybe it's a set meal um, a few times a week, or maybe it's a, snack, a set kind of snack block that you allocate for those networking opportunities so that you're not often having to figure out where do you fit it in, where do you squeeze it in, and again, so that it makes it easy for you, right? Um, ultimately, this strategy works, again, also in a digital first world. Everyone still has to consume, everyone still has to eat, um, everyone still is looking for a break and for you to be able to have that plugged in on a on a routine basis also allows you to manage your capacity in a structured way so as with everything having a schedule and a routine is helpful and for you if whether it be once a week whether it's five times a week depending on your um your preference it allows you to know that i'm managing my capacity with respect to these uh engagements and not overwhelming myself as well right um but also maintaining a constant flow particularly for those of you who are doing the outbound networking and really looking to accomplish a goal whether it be a new job learn about an industry it really helps you manage that in a very structured way and scale it. um one of my favorite tips um is start with a laugh um it's proven fact that humor builds trust. Um, actually, literally this week, um, one of my um, uh, favorite people uh, re released a book called Humor Seriously. Um, and the, the book is Why Humor is a Secret Weapon in Business and Life. Uh, but really the foundation of that is um, the book and kind of the thesis is all around how humor builds trust even in professional settings. Um, so don't be afraid to use humor. I know um, oftentimes people feel like in a networking situation, particularly outbound networking, you need to be formal, you need to um, be as professional, but humor can be uh, an, a, a secret weapon um, in, in a networking context or in a business context period. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from um, Eric Schmidt, um, and not, I'm not biased because I work at Alphabet, but um, is, I've, I've learned the hard, often the hard way that the best way to be taken seriously is to not take yourself too seriously. My teams are always at their best when approaching problems with levity, which entails both humility and optimism and 
always engenders trust. Plus, it's more fun. Mike, this book. Um, and so what I would say is that uh, always use humor to your advantage. And don't be afraid to use humor to your advantage because humor builds bonds, it diffuses tension, it boosts innovation, and of course, bolster, bolster, bolsters sorry, resilience in um, times where we could honestly use a, a laugh. And many of your people will, many of the people that you're connecting with will be excited um, and more eager to chat, um, having um, started the conversation with a smile. My next one is obvious, I would say, um, but uh, be sure to take a few notes. I think your future self will thank you is what I uh, like to say. Um, I know my future self thanks me often um, by jotting down some notes. Um, I think the older I get, the worse my memory, I will say. Um, so for those of you, maybe, maybe, Maybe for those, maybe some of you can maintain and remember all of the touch points and the notes um, uh, in your brain. But for me, I think taking notes, a few notes, jotting them on a notepad on my phone or keeping a small um, writing pad in my pocket has always proven to be incredibly helpful. Um, I, I will say jotting down a few notes and tips from your search and your research uh, ahead of time, but more importantly, or most importantly, follow-ups immediately after each meeting. Um, and it doesn't have to be long form. I think just a few bullets around, oh, yes, this in this conversation, I was going to connect them to this this colleague. They were going to send me this piece of thought, this thought piece that they produce or and we were going to connect again in six months on this topic. I think really allowing yourself to get all of that down allows you to free up space in your own mind and kind of move on to the next thing you have to do in your day, um, but also allows you to follow up on those even months later. And I oftentimes open up notes on my phone from many, many months ago as a way to remember interesting touch points with another person that I met or as my own life situation or priorities change. Um, it's a great way to, to, to validate um, past conversations and say like, oh yes, this was a person who, um, if this were to happen, I was going to connect with them. So let me reach back out to them um, about this topic. Um, but don't force yourself to rely solely on your own memory. The next one, I would say, as, as you're getting to the end of any conversation or any sort of networking engagement, I would say always remember to pass the baton. Um, network your own network um, is how I like to think of it as well. Um, but the, the question I always ask myself um, and, and as I'm engaging with someone, especially towards the end of a um, conversation is, who can I connect you, connect you with to help you achieve your own goals? Um, and for me, that is um, incredibly important because ultimately that is how you build and nurture your own network, right? You, you're at, you, and that's how you add this person to your network. So best practice is always make sure also with these that double opt-in. Um, so ultimately you want to make sure that you're never um, doing, I, I hate putting people in situations in which they feel obligated to reach back out to someone. Um, so make sure you're, you are doing a double opt-in and, and that any connection is of mutual benefit. But I would say always be sure to pass the baton because again, that's how you nurture your own network and, and grow your own network um, and add someone to your network um, in a very organic way, natural way. And then lastly, what I will say is, um, like I said, um, in the vein of one of my favorite movies is pay it forward. Um, you get out what you put in um, to your network. Um, and I think um, a quote from, to connect to the hall, but a quote from Keith Ferrazzi's book, Never Eat Alone, that I find really, really powerful is that real networking is about finding ways to make other people more successful. Um, so think about how do you take that philosophy into your own networking um, and your own um, uh, nurturing of your, your colleagues and your community? Um, how do you find ways to make other people more successful and put, put in value into the network and contribute to network? And network is not just Networking is not just about extracting value from those that you know and those around you, but it's about putting into that value so that you can extract value at a later date. And um, oftentimes people will leave a conversation and engagement uh, feeling a lot more eager and excited to have connected with you and to reconnect with you if you've demonstrated ways to also contribute value. And this can be also for outbound um, networking as well, right? Um, if you're reaching out to someone um, to learn more about a job or something that they produce, um, always think about what can you contribute and who can you connect them to that might help them um, in their own endeavors, right? Um, might be a good connection from a prior con a conversation that you've had even in your outbound networking, right? Um, so always think about how you can pay it forward and, and how you get out, um, how you can get out more by putting in more um, into your network. 
Um, and lastly, um, this is the half I would say is um, remember the mantra um, and remember the goal is to always be a best supporting actor and actress um, with respect to um, your network, right? Um, so um, always networking is always about helping others. And I think you, as I mentioned before, you'll get out what you put in. And I think ultimately for me and for everyone, your goal should always be to, to be known as the best supporting actor or actress within your network. Um, and really um, the person who's helped other people to be successful, because ultimately that that's when you find the opportunities come back to you um, and 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 both both organically as well as um, inbound, um, because people look to you and know you as um, the hub within um, the network um, and the hub within uh, the ecosystem. So always think about um, how can you take this philosophy and this mantra into any conversation that you're looking to help others versus I'm looking for others to help me because I think ultimately you'll find that you're that's when you actually are able to get more value in the longer term and play the long tail game um, with with your own networking um, and building these connections. Um, so lastly, I want to share some resources. I, I mentioned, uh, of course, um, the book Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi um, is one that I would encourage everyone to check out. Um, secondly, there's a book called Humor Seriously um, by Naomi Bagdonis um, and Jennifer Aker. Um, that is the book around um, humor and how it instills trust in your network. Um, I, of course, <laughs> jokingly, but included it. Uh, Real Keep Moving from 2000, uh, Pay It Forward if you haven't seen it. Um, I think that one is um, one that, again, has, has really, really kind of... Uh, create a philosophy for me with how I approach my ecosystems and my networks. But, um, and then lastly, I've included here, um, if you're looking for resources for, um, particularly those of you on the job search, but are looking for resources for um, professional networking tips, um, the Stanford Graduate School of Business has a lot of resources online um, at gsb.stanford.edu slash alumni slash career resources, job search networking. Um, but a lot of tips, a lot of thought pieces, a lot of frameworks um, that I would encourage you to explore more. I would be remiss if I didn't invite you to all to join my network. Um, so feel free to reach out on Twitter, Jason A. Scott, or LinkedIn, Jason Alexander Scott, or shoot me an email, Jason Scott at google.com uh, anytime. Um, and looking forward to supporting you um, in your networking journey and helping you get more value out of networking. Thank you. Amazing. Great. So this was perfect. Um, Jason, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, How's it going? Here we, yeah, it's going well. So here we are. And then we are going to take lots of questions from the chat, actually. Uh, so I would like to actually start with your tip. Uh, so you said that, you know, you start with a laugh, right? So let's ask you, actually, this is a question coming from me. What is your funniest or best like experience when you were like, you know, uh, meeting a new person like in your life while networking? Maybe this might be a good question to start. So just laugh it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, um, generally, I, I and it's not even just starting with love, I think starting with a smile. And, I, I, and it goes back to what I was saying before um, around, um, doing your research ahead of time, there's always some common interest. So for me, I some of my best ones and best experiences are when, we, when we're doing an activity that just incites laughter. So whether it be uh, trying to solve something together, I've done back when we could do these, um, escape the room as a cool way to just meet new people, but also yeah. be doing something that's fun and kind of um, makes everyone feel a little bit humble um, in those situations. So lots of those, but I would say like, think, and make it natural to you, right? So I think for, for everyone, it's thinking about um, what are those scenarios in which you are ha you do have fun, right? Whether it be yeah. something active or something creative, and then how do you invite people into your world? Because people love novel experiences and they also feel, they love personal experiences, so yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, perfect, thank you. And then let's start with uh, the questions coming from the audience then. So the first question, what was your most daunting networking experience, Jason? So <laughs> Yeah, I, and I think this everyone can speak um, or probably agree to this, that usually the big kind of conferences and those types of events often are feel daunting, right? You go to a Google I.O. or you go to a, a Google Cloud Next and there's tens of thousands of people there. I think um, 
for me, those are really, really daunting. I, I do find those types of um, experiences in, on on the topic of introversion. I think it, they're really draining, right? And, and I think it you have to my point earlier, you have to really protect your fuel tank or think about how to replenish it. Um, and for me, on the protecting side, um, it's all about being intentional. So I never, with those types of events, never just go in with the hope of. Um, serendipitously running into someone i think it's just i have to plan ahead of time like who are, who who and what are the things that are really going to be the highest yield for me and like leave out all the other things because honestly you'll just exhaust yourself and then you'll end up quitting i i can't tell you i'm sure a lot of people can um this resonates with a lot of people but there have been some conferences where i've gone i've walked in and then five minutes later i said okay i can't do this <laughs> I've left, right and i think you really have to think about protecting yourself and protecting and being and knowing yourself right um and protecting your time. So I think the conferences though, still to this day are, are definitely daunting um, for me, the big ones. And, and I think it's just about um, really um, using those tips in particular in those cases where it just becomes overwhelming. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good question. And then Naomi uh, is asking, hi, Jason. I've only done in-person networking and but trying to explore solid online tactics. Now that we are stuck at home due to pandemic, any tips? Yeah, this is actually a common question, I guess, for all of us. Yeah, I think, um, uh, again, a lot of the tips still apply, but I think um, one thing you have to think about it from the other side and, and reframe it as an opportunity. One, the barriers are just so much lower, right? Um, it's so much easier to get someone, you're not limited by proximity. So you, there's so much, so much easier to get someone to hop on a quick 15 minute coffee chat when they don't even have to live their leave their living room than it used to be right um where you have to um, coordinate actually the friction was there right so for me i think one don't be intimidated by it i think um people are actually more willing i would say to meet in this time versus um in in prior times because again the barrier is so much lower and i think again um you can be a lot more targeted and um and 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 who you're actually trying to connect with. So I think for me, I, I set up a recurring um a couple slots in my week that are 15 minute slots that stay there. And then I just have those already ready to go if there's someone that I'm looking to connect with. Oh, how about my Friday 9 a.m. coffee slot? Um I don't tell them that it's a recurring slot, but I have it on my, and ready to go. And I use those as um my ongoing time to connect with individuals got it yeah we needed more you know tips and tricks i guess like uh for sure like from the beginning you know of the pandemic so uh we feel you know like really really stuck at home but these are really great tips let's move on to the next question so alice is asking is it normal to feel like a bother as a junior bothering folks uh you hope you will be mentors or help when you when all you can give is wide eyes and admiration. Um, I, yeah. Those are good. Go no, I was gonna say, yeah. I would say don't downplay the admiration. Um, I think I put this in chat, but people love flattery. Um, and um, I actually, it's funny because I use the book, Keith's book, um, Never Even Alone a lot, but um, part of the way that I actually met Keith as like a mentor was I said, hey, I really love your book and I would love to disconnect and hear more thoughts about it. And people, that, people love that, right? To be able to say that you did the work, you read their book or heard their talk that they, spoken or um use their product right and i think um opening the door with flattery that's definitely a tool i think in your, that you can have in your arsenal as a way to get people to start the conversation um so the hook that you have to get people to start the conversation because people love that and i think people also love giving back and mentorship so don't downplay that you're not it's you're not actually bothering and many times you're actually providing value because there are a lot of people who seek out opportunities to to mentor as their own personal growth, uh, um, a way to grow and give back. Um, so don't downplay it. I think d definitely use it to, as, a, as to your advantage, um, particularly if it's someone that you actually do admire a piece of work that they've done before. But I can't tell you how many people have responded to an email just because I've included that one line, like, hey, I read this, or hey, I love this that you did, or hey, I watched this video that you did. Um, that goes a lot further than just the, hey, I would love to connect. Yeah, it's not just one way, actually, like it's just two ways of, you know, conversation. They just feed themselves too with those, you know, questions or like networking opportunities too. I see this, you know, like as an opportunity by just by myself. So yeah, good tip. Um, 
So David is asking, does Stanford University help your network a lot? Yeah, Jason. I would say, I would say, so yes, I would definitely be lying if I said it didn't, but um, a couple things I would say, it also helps my friends and my, my colleagues network a lot as well. So don't be afraid also to tap into the networks of those around you. Um, and I'm often, I'm, and I talked about this, the, the value of sharing your network, but I often share my network as well, right? And so I think, even um, even don't don't find yourself limited to communities that you already are a part of. Like there are ways to tap into the networks and tap into other networks, even if you're not you didn't go to school to this place or you weren't a part of this community group, et cetera. So definitely use that to your advantage. And I would say um, don't be scared to do that. You never know. <laughs> you yeah. never know what's going to happen, right? So yeah, definitely. Um, cool. And then next question. So what Sol is asking, hi, Jason, when using proactive networking on LinkedIn, for example, how would one exploit the opportunity when there's a character limit that prevents us from using many of these tips? Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You only need to use the hook, right? You don't need to, um, similar to the, the the advice that was given around your resume, like no one's going to read a 10 page res or well, someone yeah. might, but um, I'm more likely to read the introductory uh, introduction and stay there. Same thing applies here, right? You start with the hook um, and then in the conversation, you can pull out other things, right? So start with the, 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 the line that is most compelling. Hey, again, um, I think going back to what I was saying earlier about being transparent, like, hey, saw this, saw XYZ or read XYZ, really loved it and was inspired by it, would love to connect on this because I, I'm looking to either grow in this way or um, expand my knowledge in this way. So being very specific and targeted and direct, I think it actually goes a long way because even myself, and I'm I'm no, um, I, I, I'm definitely not getting as many LinkedIn messages as other people, but I imagine, um, even or I know even for myself, I I quickly skim through <laughs> and and see. Um, and so when that when everything is summarized in the same way that you would have a thesis in writing a paper, if everything is summarized in the intro, like I know upfront like why they're reaching out and what they're looking to get out of it, and I can also be transparent with them around my capacity, my time, and 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 helping them. Right, um, allow people to help you by not not um, beating around the bush, I guess, with respect to what you're looking for. Yeah. Definitely short, like short and sweet, right? Just keep it simple to get the hook and then like other, uh, then you can just uh, explore the other opportunities. Um, 100%. Cool. So let's go on uh, with the next one. Nonia is asking, I am early in my career and I am secure, insecure reaching out slash asking for help from those further in their career because I feel I don't give anything back to them. How can I give value to those relationships? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. One, um, I think you are giving value in many times by just uh, the flattery and or the ask for mentorship sometimes is enough value in itself. But I will say if you are also insecure about that, I think there are other ways to, to not necessarily have to give the value yourself, but maybe you had another conversation with someone else in the industry and you you say, hey, I, I also met with this person, would love to connect you if you're not already connected to, um, they're in a similar field to you or they do similar work as you um, and I, I'm happy to facilitate, right? So I that means to me all the time. If I'm doing research on a new space or um, learning about a new industry, I oftentimes offer up past people that I connected with to the person I'm talking to. Like, hey, I don't know if you already know this person, but let me connect you because it seems like you're working in a similar space or your experts in a similar space. So um, that's also how you build your network and also build value to a network, right? You don't necessarily have to be the expert to also be a hub within a network, right? You, you just have to be the connector. Um, so oftentimes you can be value, you can have value by just connecting people without necessarily having to have the expertise, right? Um, but, but I will say again, don't downplay the value of the flattery and just the ask for mentorship because a lot of people that's what they're looking for uh, later in their career as well. Yeah, true, amazing. And then um, Rachel, do you use any tools to organize your contacts? Yeah, I would say on this, um, 
use what's organic to, or sorry, what is natural to you. I think um, at the end of the day, um, whatever, there are a lot of tools out there. Um, I've seen some that are very complex, some that are very basic. I know people who even use things like Salesforce for their own networks. Um, so I think it's, it's a matter of what's organic to you, right? Um, um, if, if you're not going to uh, adopt a new app or a new tool, then just figure out how to make LinkedIn work for you, right? But if or if you are like um, and you love new apps and the latest things, there are a lot of things. There's one called Four Degrees that's really good for professional networks as well, um, and 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 connecting. But again, I think it it's more important that you choose something that you're actually going to use and keep up, right? So um, I'm. I'm, I'm a minimalist at heart, so I don't like adding a lot of things um, because I know I just won't use them and I won't keep them up to date. So again, it's more important about acknowledging who you are and kind of what feels natural. Um, and if 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 a, a notepad feels natural or, or, or something in your email or even just written, a Rolodex feels natural, like just lean into it, right? Don't, don't try and change who you are. Yeah, definitely. So just however you feel comfortable, would be the best answer, I guess. What's all? Um, how would one go about finding slash reaching out to people that are higher up or more established in an industry to help oneself level up? Yeah, yeah. So a couple things. Um, I think there's always there's a, I would I would also not be afraid of going through multiple channels first and foremost. I'll say this, but um, you always of course could try things like LinkedIn. But I will say also look for other folks on their team. Um, a lot of people that are very, very senior have executive assistants or um, administrative teams that can also help. Um, I often, if I'm looking to speak with someone super, super senior, I include that person on the introduction just because I know that those people have daily, if not daily, at least weekly meetings with their teams. And the, the team can all, can oftentimes say, look, hey, did you see that? Or, hey, did you see that come to That looks interesting and pass it in front of them physically because candidly, the more successful these people get, uh, probably the more inbound interest they have and, and uh, the harder it is for them to keep track. It's, don't take it personally. Sometimes they just haven't seen it. So um, I'd say like, think about who's around them and how you can use those people also to help you get connected. Yeah, that's true. Cool. Let's go with Jennifer's question. How would you recommend staying in touch with those you have met through uh, networking? After a coffee chat, What? What can you do next to stay connected? Actually, like this is a great question because as you can see, like while we are just networking for the first time, this is important. Yes, definitely go out there and then network. But how should we stay connected with those, right? Maybe some tips and tricks. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. let's just get it. Yeah, I mean, very tactically, um, no surprises. One, never leave a conversation without the action items. So make sure you have clear action items around like what like what are you what did you commit to or what were you excited about and if you haven't like you should always have an action item um if it makes sense that action item should also include a follow-up meeting but maybe it doesn't make sense if it doesn't include a follow-up meeting make sure you do connect them and ask them i would say ask them like are there ways do you mind if i add you on linkedin do you mind if i add you on twitter etc as a way to kind of stay on top of the person but i think even if you don't have an action item with them set an action item with yourself. If, the, if this is someone that you want to maintain in your relationship, like go ahead, set, I mean, honestly, I sometimes write myself an email or write my, put a calendar hold up even for myself around like, hey, reach back out to this person in two weeks. If it's something that you need to nurture, right? And want to nurture. But I'd say first and foremost, always have an action item and post the meeting. I love it when someone after a meeting, um, even if it's more just a networking meeting, sends me a follow up that includes those action items like, and a summary of what we were going to follow up on, um, because that helps me as well, right? It helps me know, like, what did I promise them? Did I promise them something? Or did I ask, did they ask for a connection? Or did they ask for a follow up? Because candidly, the more you can take the burden off of the other person, the the more they feel like they come away with a smile on their face, like it, it was, it, it didn't feel daunting to them as well. Yeah. Great. Uh, and then let's move on. We have like 20 minutes left. We have lots of questions still. Um, hi, Jason. Do you have any tips about how network uh, when you're starting a startup? Yo, oh, this is your question. This is, like, yeah, this is 100% <laughs> what I do. Um, so I guess first and foremost, it depends on what stage. But if you're at the very early stage, I mean, I'd say founders, the most successful founders learn from 
their their past uh, from past examples. So the more you can connect to folks that are that are that have been in that same space, that same vertical before, that have start tried to start companies before, maybe not the founders, even people on their teams, etc. Just the more you can learn, the better. So. Um, I'd say like using tools that exist, pitch book, crunch base, but see, are there companies out there who've tried to do this before? And honestly, a lot of those tools will tell you who who were the founders, et cetera. And, and again, like oftentimes founders in particular love connecting to other entrepreneurs. They love connecting to people who are thought partners and they can just kind of share ideas, share war stories. And I think um, main, and those will be great people, even if you have no agenda now, to having your network in the future because those are the people you'll probably want to raise money from the same investors that they raise money from, or at least learn from them. You'll probably want to potentially, I mean, maybe you'll hire some of the same people that used to work for them if they don't work for them today. You'll hopefully save a lot of operational <laughs> headaches and mistakes from learning from their mistakes. So build those early um, so that you can always reach back out. And honestly, maybe they'll, if their startup isn't, isn't running anymore, maybe they'll want to actually join your team, right? And support you. Um, so um, I'd say this, definitely, definitely, definitely reach out to those folks, but using tools. I mean, you again, there are a lot of tools out there that exist, like a pitch book and a crutch base where you can actually find um, folks who've tried to do what you're trying to do before. Um, and maybe they're in a different geography. So it even becomes even more complimentary. Maybe it's a partnership at a, at a future date as well. Perfect. And then I am from India and I am moving to California for my master's this fall. Wow, congratulations. Is it too early to already make connections for a potential referral? Good question. Perfect. No, um, I would say you you should always, um, it's never too early to make a connection. The last time, the last, I tell this to everyone, um, founders who are raising money or people generally, but you you never want to feel like you're at the last minute when it comes to um, connecting with someone. It's always better to have connected with them before so that it's just a follow on when you actually need something, whether you're raising money, whether you're looking to hire, et cetera. So the more you can create a connections without a, an, an agenda and without um, a, um, kind of an urgent need, the better, because the, la the last thing I want um, or well, I wouldn't say the last thing I want, but something I don't enjoy is when my first conversation is when someone ha like is asking me for money or introduction to a program, et cetera. It's much more pleasant for me if they're just trying to connect because we have a similar passion, they're in a space they want to learn from, et cetera. And then later on, after we have a connection, the next time around, they are asking for something or mentioning, not even asking, hey, now I'm actually like, serious and progress and I'm, I'm interested more so more seriously in joining this program or joining this company or et cetera. So I'd say start the connections now when you don't need something so that the next time when you do need something, you already have a, a rapport with the person, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes it more natural actually when you give some timing in between, I guess, right? So they don't think like they, you, you, like you take the advantage of that networking. So it just makes it more natural. Yeah, I agree. Um, cool. And then uh, let's go to the next one. Jenny is asking, hi, I'm taking online classes and was wondering what would be a good way to network slash develop a relationship with my classmates slash professors. Yeah, online yeah. is the tricky part. <laughs> Online is a tricky part. And again, it, and they all just require you to be so intentional. I would say for professors, the the trick that I mentioned before works so well for professors. Most, most professors have published papers that a lot of times, a lot of people haven't read. So they're often impressed if you if you say, hey, I read this, this paper you wrote, or I read this article you published. Um, I've often, I've, I, I could almost say I'm 100% of a return or response rate when saying that to a professor, because again, they, unlike celebrities and things like that, they don't, they don't often have a ton of people reading all of their publications, et cetera. So for you to say that to them, it really does actually make them feel like you're serious and excited about um, what they're doing and what they're working on. So I say, that's a great way to open up with a professor, honestly, um, with, uh, and professors, I, I, not in a bad way, but professors definitely um, are subject to flattery, I would say, when it comes to the research that they do. Um, with your classmates, it's interesting. I think um, it kind of depends on the type of um, course that you're doing, but I think ultimately it's great when, um, it, it's great, sorry, I saw someone in chat that validated what I just said, so <laughs> awesome, Jennifer. Um, but it's great when um, someone, 
um, oftentimes for me, at least when approaching a new class, like find a way that you can provide value to that group. Like maybe you're the person who creates community. Maybe you're the person who is helping them like understand who else is in their class ahead of time. Maybe you're the person um, helping them stay on top of things. But I think find a way to start early becoming a little bit of a hub within that network by providing some value to the network. And maybe the value is just connecting people. So maybe like by starting like say, Hey, I'm really interested in making sure that we all get to know each other. Like, is it like, I created this group, I created this LinkedIn group for everyone, or Hey, I created this Slack group for everyone, et cetera. Right. Um, just to start, um, being known as the person, the hub within the ecosystem, because oftentimes that's, that pays off in spades once you're actually in, in the community, because you are known, you now have that reputation as a person who started connecting everyone, even if it was just as simple as, again, as creating a LinkedIn group or creating a group on a Slack or even an email alias, right, um, to get stuff going. But um, it's always great, like five years later, when someone's like, I would have never met my co-founder or my spouse or my partner had you not created this this group um, before we started a class. So they, they will then have those positive associations with you for something so easy to do, right? Um, it requires very minimal work. Great. Um, and then, yeah, we have still time. And then this is the last question, I guess, coming from the audience. So let's get this one. Hello, I was just wondering what sorts of questions I could ask in a networking session that would give me the most value. Would it about relevant skills, opportunities, networking techniques, etc. I think um, so. There's a lot to unpack here. I'd say first, I'll unpack the word value. I think one most value in the relationship. I think honestly is is how can I help you? I think is a great question to ask, um, regardless of who you are in the com in connecting, because ultimately people. Um, again, come away, you, it's all about the feeling that you that they will come away from um, come away with, right. And you want them to come away with a feeling of, hey, I got I got a lot of value out of this, right? I, I got this is a, a connection that I want, even if it's someone that you admire, or someone much more senior than you in your career, etc. Right. So I think, definitely, even if you're just closing, um the conversation with that like definitely try and think about how you can also provide value to that person either through another connection or um through support maybe a referral maybe the recruiting etc right i think um secondarily i think the, the just candidly another way for you to make sure you maximize the value of the relationship is like hey make sure you close with a hey would you mind if i reach back out if i have another question or would you mind if i reach back out if to to share with you my progress or something to to make sure you open the door for future connections right because it's not about the value you're going to get in that one conversation it's about the value you're going to get over the lifetime of that relationship so make sure that you don't leave the conversation without opening the door to future connections even if even if you don't know what that future ask will be but saying like hey do you mind if i reach back out if i have another question or hey do you mind if i reach back out if um to share with you my progress on this paper or whatever you're doing right um and they're oftentimes are going to say yes especially if it's just to to look at something over an email or to answer a question over an email yeah great and then thank you jason for answering those two so we have some still questions coming in and i i said the last one but yeah let's just get no, them no worries. all done yeah it, all perfect so jay is asking what impacts more as a reference so the university professor professor with whom i have done the research or a high profile employer i guess this is a follow-up question right yeah i mean it, it kind of depends though on a reference for what right so i think ultimately what matt what um impacts more is who's closer to the person that you're tr that you're trying to reach right so if it's a if it's a reference to go on to your phd or get into a graduate program then the university professor will obviously go a long way if it's a if, if, if it's a reference for another high profile employer then obviously but basically who will they empathize with more as a recipient of that reference right um obviously both is always great you can do both but i think like that is that would be my answer there like think about um you don't need to have a one um a one um, um a singular approach to this right you should always have um adapt your approach to the audience that you're you're addressing mm -hmm. 
Perfect. And then the next one is actually I read this one too. So I will just kind of elaborate a little bit what from what I'm understanding, but let's just read it through. Jack is asking, I'm about to join my first job, but not too keen on the location. I will work there for two years. How would you recommend moving locations within the company? I guess this is about like how to network within the company when you are just, you know, moving the location. So maybe yeah. we can elaborate. Yeah. I, I would say start now. Um, first and foremost, I think you, you you can probably find people even before you even start like on LinkedIn, et cetera, that are in the location you want to go, right? So I'd say start building those connections now before you need it um, because those will be the people. I'm actually helping someone now, um, similarly, even at Google, but those will be the people who can then say like, oh, I know this person was very interested in living, um, living here or moving here, relocating here. As soon as I see a job pop up, in this location, like I'm going to share that with them. And what you want is to reach a point where you're getting the inbounds instead of you sending the outbounds, right? So by making people aware of your goal early and often, they will then share with you when those opportunities arise, right? So then you will have inbound opportunities. So I would say start now. Um, two, I mean, two years is will fly by. <laughs> so start now. <laughs> Look who's there. Um, and the cool part is, it, there's so many ways by starting now that you just um, you open up so many doors because maybe maybe one of those people decides to leave the company and that opens up a role. Maybe they're growing a team and that opens up a role. Like there's so many ways that um, that this can become an opportunity for you. So all you have to do is make sure that people know though because no one's going to share anything with you if they don't know, right? Yeah. That's true. Actually, from my exper personal experience too, like the person that I met like back in time actually ended up, you know, like uh, giving me like a referral, like at Google. So like, you never know what's going to happen. Just start now. Every day is a new day. So those are the things I guess. Yeah, really, really important. Um, so she, what are your tips for people who speak English, but it's not their first language like me when it comes to succeeding and standing out during interviews? <laughs> Maybe I'll let you answer then. Uh, <laughs> personal experience. <laughs> You go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I mean, you, if you have things that I would say, definitely add it. But from my side, I think um, I personally am a fan of people who are very transparent about th their concerns or um, um, things that they're worried about up front. So I think by just acknowledging that for me, at least as an interviewer, that is, that is something I respect when someone is very forthcoming and upfront around, um, around that. So then I can also adapt, right, and make sure that I... Um, am, am adapting as an interviewer to make sure I'm clear, make sure I'm asking questions in a very clear way, make sure I'm providing feedback in a very clear way, et cetera. So um, I'd say that for me is is very important. Like I think just being upfront and forthcoming with that and like saying and making sure that like the interviewer also knows that um, and doesn't take for granted or uh, assume, right? Maybe Maybe they don't know and have that context. Yeah, being transparent for sure, definitely. Cool. And then I guess this is the last question uh, before we close out. So what Sol is asking, Jason, thank you so much for doing this. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Jason. It's been very helpful. I have another question. How can I ask help from a connection or have them use their network to help me? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think don't be shy to do it. Honestly, I think a lot of people think that like the ask has to be very burdensome. And I think, um, and and sometimes they might be. So I would say, like, definitely, like, think about how how much of a burden is this ask. But sometimes it's it's just a matter of them sending an email, and it takes thirty seconds, right? So like, don't often think that. Um, don't be afraid to ask because you think it's a burden, right? And I and I fall and I'm guilty of this too. I don't. I often don't um, ask for things, and then I realize that the person would have done it without even thinking anything of it. So I'd say, um, I'd say. Um, one that it, like don't be afraid to ask and if you feel like it is a burdensome ask maybe you can break it into something that's less burdensome for them but then secondly um by them connecting you to their network as long as you are um going to follow through with what you commit to you're actually providing value to them because ultimately again a network is only as 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 good as i mean think of it as a, a not to get sciencey but think of it as like a neuron the more <laughs> that it's activated the stronger it becomes right so the same thing about a network right and so by you giving them an opportunity to pass someone through their network they are also reinforcing that network so um sometimes you have to remind yourself that right like and and that you are also 
you are you could be the value that they're putting into their network as long as you're conscious of um, not extracting too much from it and up and out and paying it forward to give it back to it yes perfect i guess this is the last question this was the last question and then i should like just thank you uh jason this was an amazing session thank you so much for joining and then you know just sharing your tips and tricks and also like i would like to thank all of the audience right now joining us so hopefully you will follow like jason if they have any questions further i guess they can just reach out to you on linkedin and then like from there you can take it but again thank you thank you and then i will just say goodbye thank goodbye you. and reach out anytime thank you all for having me um and yes practice practice your skills on me I, i'll be forgiving so yeah reach out anytime perfect thank you um with that said let's just call it a day and then i will just close out with the some information that i have for the next session so thank you again everyone for joining LOA today hope you all enjoyed the sessions or both of the sessions we would like to kindly request from you to fill out the feedback surveys in the follow-up email or the links that we share on screen or like you know on the chat so we can improve the program along the way also you are going to obtain a certificate of participation if you fill out the feedback surveys after the sessions so you can also use the hashtag uh, hashtag LOA training uh, to share with us how you thought about the sessions and then how you are you know going to join the next sessions and so on um, so we are going to have our next session next month and we will be giving you more information if you sign up on the website already we are going to share the links uh, here uh, and then in the emails of course if you have any questions please email us at elevate-team at google.com. And with that said, we are looking forward to seeing you next month. Till then, take care and stay safe.